Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NP Talk course on Title 20th Century Fiction. We were looking at uh, and examining James Joyce's novel Ulysses. Uh, so we've seen already certain sections where uh, the streams of consciousness technique is used very effectively by Joyce and how the mindscape or the landscape they correspond with each other. And obviously this is a story about one day in Dublin but this one temporal frame is actually quite deceptively simple because what is buried in this one day is a series of different temporal narratives, a series of different stories crisscrossing each other in a very post-modernist kind of a way. So there's this hyperlinked quality about Ulysses, why each story connects to another story and the different characters crisscrossing each other in different points of time. Now, uh, obviously Leopold Bloom, who is a Jewish uh, uh, Irishman in Dublin over here, uh, he is someone who is, works in an advertising uh, company. He's, a, he's, a, he's someone who's canvassing for advertisement all the time. So he's a canvasser essentially. Uh, so, uh, advertisement plays a very important role in Ulysses. So, we have different advertising slogans booming in every now and then. Uh, but what that also means is that uh, everything can be turned into something flippant because the whole idea of advertisement is to make things catchy, uh, is to condense meanings into a simple narrative which can be dished out and consumed uh, very, very quickly. So, if you remember the earlier section in Ulysses where uh, Bloom and his uh, wife Molly Bloom, they talk about a very spiritual term metempsychosis which is a transmigration of souls uh, and obviously metempsychosis you know, becomes a spiritual metaphysical kind of a conceit but that very quickly cuts into uh, you know the change of a kidney and you know, the kidney which is being cooked in the kitchen uh, which becomes overcooked and overburnt. Right, so the burning of a kidney into something else, uh, something non-edible, is very interestingly conjoined and juxtaposed with this whole idea of metempsychosis, which is a transition or trans uh, migration, etc. Now, um, uh, in this section that uh, you know we look at today is Bloom realizing how you know he the whole idea of his country becomes important over here, the nation becomes important over here, and how suddenly the imagination of a nation becomes uh, like a glimpse in his uh, advertisement, uh, you know, soaked uh, imagination. So everything is an advertisement for him, and suddenly he sees uh, he thinks of Ireland uh, as a nation, and how he realizes how he has never really seen his country except uh, in little glimpses. And this is a section which should be on the screen. This is a little bloom uh, and reminiscing about this nation and, and thinking about how he hasn't seen most parts of his own country. And this is um, on the screen in the memory which I'm going to read out. Strange, he never saw his real country, Ireland, my country. Member for the college green. He boomed that work day walk up, tag for all it is worth. It's the ads and side features seller weekly, not a stale news in the official gazette. Queen Anne is dead, published by authority in the year 1000 and. Domestic is situated in the townland of Rosanellis, barony uh, of Tidahenge. To all whom it may concern, schedule a schedule pursuant to statute showing a return a number of mules and janets exported from Bolina. Nature notes, cartoons, Phil Blake's weekly pattern bull story, Uncle Toby's page for tiny tots, country bumpkins queries, DMSA editor. What is a good cure for flatulence? I'd like that part. Learn a lot teaching others a personal note. MAP, mainly all pictures. Shapely brothers, bathers on golden stand. World's biggest balloon, double marriage of sisters celebrated. Two bridegrooms laughing hurtly at each other. Coupani too, printer, more Irish than the Irish. So, you know, the whole idea of stylization becomes important over here. The reason why I read out this random uh, sections from Ulysses, he has a series of uh, different kinds of advertisement politics or advertisement narratives which are at play with each other over here. And obviously what that means is that, you know, uh, the entire idea of meaning becomes stylized, meaning becomes sliced into small pieces and dished out, right? And obviously the stylization makes, you know, something more Irish than the Irish. Uh, that's a very important line over here, which is something that I want to spend a little bit of time in. So the whole point of making something more Irish than the Irish is obviously uh, artificially injecting uh, Irishness as a stylized category. So Irishness over here is not really a national or a cultural category anymore. I Irishness over here becomes a stylized category, something which is consumed as a stylized uh, section of meaning. 
Okay, so stylization and this incessant, endless production of meanings, uh, half chopped meanings, and small condensed sentences becomes very much a part of the uh, meaning landscape in Ulysses because, you know, as you can see, uh, in the entire story, most of it, uh, in, apart from these sections talking about Molly Bloom and uh, uh, Stephen de Dallas, is focalized uh, through Leopold Bloom. So, focalization becomes a very important uh, factor in Ulysses. Uh, focalization, of course, means that the entire story is uh, told from a certain perspective. It's a camera term, focalization. The perspective is set, uh, and that perspective is a perspective which is used to, to control and deliver a story. Right? So, focalization is a way uh, uh, to an ad man's imagination. The machines clanked in uh, three, four time, thump, thump, thump. Now, if he got paralyzed there and no one knew how to stop them, they clanked on and on the same, printed over and over and up and back. Monkey doodle, the whole thing, want a cool head. So, again, the whole idea of being consumed by machines become important over here because the machines are clanking in incessantly, tom, 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 and he just uh, visualizes an image where if he gets rid of this machine, this printing machine, uh, they will just print on him incessantly and you know, they'll make some monkey doodle uh, out of his body, of, out of his uh, organic body. Well, get it into the evening edition, Councillor, Haynes said. Soon he calling him by Lord Mayor. Lord John is backing him, they say. The foreman, with an answering, scribbled press on a corner of the sheet and made a sign to a typesetter. He handed the sheet silently over the dirty glass screen. Right, thanks, Haynes said, moving off. Mr. Blooms stood in his way. If you want to draw, the cashier is just going to lunch, he said, uh, pointing backwards with his thumb. Did you? Haynes asked. Mm, Mr. Bloom said, look sharp and you'll catch him. Thanks, old man, Hines said, I'll tap him too. He hurried on eagerly towards the free man's journal. Three bobs are lent him and Magus, three weeks, third hint. So again, look at the way in which information becomes very stylized in Ulysses. So this person, Hines, he had borrowed some money from Leopold Bloom and Bloom meets him uh, on the way uh, to work. And uh, this is obviously part of a printing machine uh, room in which the two people meet. And he's dropping hints and, you know, and asking him to deliver a return his money. Uh, so he tells hints that there's a cashier, the cashier's over there. So if you catch him, he might lend you some cash in advance, lend you some money in advance, some of your salary in advance. And obviously what he's trying to tell is, uh, I lend you uh, three bob, I lent you three, you know, uh, Irish uh, currency you know, some time back, three weeks ago, and, and I've given you the third hint. So the reference of three obviously becomes important. Three bob, three weeks, third hint, uh, which is obviously the triple tree, the nine, which is a holy number for Christians. Uh, and obviously Christianity in Ulysses becomes a very interesting uh, form of representation. Uh, it's a form of consumption and also a form of representation. It's a tree bob I lent him in Amigos, three weeks, third hint. So the triple tree, the triple tree which makes it nine, uh, makes a uh, very flippant representation and gets a very flippant representation in this particular section. Okay, so, um, and then of course this conversation between Blooms uh, and Mr. Nanetti becomes interesting. Uh, Mr. Bloom laid his cutting on Mr. Nanetti's desk. Excuse me, counselor, he said, this ad, you see, Keynes, uh, Keys, remember? Uh, Mr. Ninetti considered the cutting a while and nodded. He wants it for he wants it in for July, Mr. Bloom said. The film man moved his pencil to it, said. But wait, Mr. Bloom said, he wants it changed. Keys, he said. He wants two keys on the top. Hell of a racket they make. He doesn't hear it, Nanan. Iron nerves. Maybe he understands what I. The full man turned round to hear patiently a lifting an elbow began to scratch slowly in the armpit of his uh, opacity jacket. Like that, Mr. Ulysses, Mr. Bloom said, crossing his four fingers at the top. Let him take that in first. Mr. Bloom, glancing sideways up from the cross he had made, saw the full man's sallow face. Thinks he has a touch of jaundice, and beyond the obedient reels uh, feeding in a huge web of paper, clank it, clank it, miles of it unreeled. What becomes of it after? Oh, wrap up meat, parcels, various uses, thousands and one things. So, again, this imagery is very symbolic because we are in, uh, quite literally in the belly of a printing machine and the intestines of a printing machine, uh, and this is a printing press in operation. So, Mr. Bloom is having a conversation with a full man uh, who is obviously hard of hearing because he's always surrounded by so much amplified noise. And the amplification is obviously part of the machinery production process. Everything is amplified, which is the same thing, the same 
representation form of stylization. The stylization amplification has become the major form of representation over here. Right, and Mr. Bloom comes in here uh, with a suggestion to change the keys, you know, certain things need to be changed in a particular advertisement. Now, as it stands, they're looking at the reels and reels of paper which is laid together in one form will become a mile. Uh, he thinks, he wonders uh, what will happen of it afterwards. So again, the whole idea of transformation becomes important. And then if you go back to the section of metempsychosis, which is supposed to be a spiritual metaphysical transformation, look at the way in which metempsychosis plays out in different mundane vulgar reality or vulgar materiality, for, such as for instance uh, talking about the uh, printing press paper. What happens to newspaper once it is consumed? It becomes a wrap for parcels, different kinds of parcels. Clank it, clank it miles of it unreeled, what becomes of it after, or oh, wrap up meat, parcels, various users, thousand and one things. So usability, functionality is part of the transition, part of the uh, change away. So the spirituality of metempsychosis, the metaphysicality of metempsychosis is now almost caricatured uh, in the materiality of changes, the materiality of different kinds of usable, usability in terms of a newspaper. What happens to a newspaper post a newspaper, uh, post its consumption becomes a parcel, a wrap for different kinds of things, vulgar things. Slipping his words deftly into the pauses of the clanking, he drew swiftly on his card woodwork, house of keys. Like that, you see. Uh, two cross keys here, a circle. Then here the name, Alexander Keys, tea, wine and spirit, merchant, so on. So these are obviously advertisement uh, uh, you know, indications, different kinds of indicators for advertisement. Better not teach him his own business. You know what, counselor, just what he wants. Then around the top in land leaded. Uh, you know, in that particular section, the house of keys, you see, do you think that's a good idea? The foreman moved his scratching head towards lower ribs and scratched there quietly. Now, if you look at the movement of the foreman, there's something almost mythical about him. It's almost like this mythical figure who know everything, see everything, but are too exhausted to speak. So the foreman over here is situated inside the machinery of the printing press. Uh, he doesn't respond, he's just receiving commands and is moving in a very, very, uh, almost an automatic, uh, a, a zombie-like way, a very numbed way. Uh, so he moved his scratching head towards lower ribs and scratched there quietly. He's not really responding, he's just getting information, he's just getting orders and instructions from different people. And he's just standing beside the machine, so he in a sense becomes the machine. So again, you can uh, make an interesting uh, comparison uh, with this foreman over here and the typewriter. Uh, of Elliot's Wasteland. If you remember Elliot's Wasteland, the section of the typewriter and the uh, cabuncular clerk, they have this loveless sex. And the sexual activity obviously is numbing in quality. And right after the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the clerk goes away, the typist, uh, who is also called a typewriter, the typist, uh, she has this half thought which passes her brain and then she puts a gramophone on record, uh, puts the record on a gramophone in a very numbed like way. So the foreman over here and the typist in, in its way are very similar figures. Both are consumed uh, by this cannibalistic quality of modernist machines and modern machines such as the typewriter and the printing press. Okay. The idea, Mr. Bloom said, is a house of keys, you know, councillor of the, the Manx Parliament, inventor of home rule, tourist, you know, from the Isle of Man, catches the eye, you see, can you do that? So again, the whole idea of catching the eye becomes important. So in that sense, you know, Ulysses becomes, uh, you know, among other things, as a great work of literature, it's a great work on the stream of consciousness, but it's also a story about advertisements, it's also a story about how to advertise things, how to make something sellable, how, how to form representational frameworks which are dishy, which are you know, attractive in quality. So that becomes a large part of the you know, narrative landscape of Ulysses, as you can see. Okay, and now, you know, he, this is a section where he watches, uh, he walks past a type setter, uh, and the types that are distributing type, distributing letters, and this is what he says, and this should be on his screen. Uh, he stayed in his walk to watch a type setter neatly uh, distributing type, read it, uh, reads it backwards first, quickly he does it. Most require some practice that. Uh, mani, mangi D K Serta P. So you know it's doing it backwards. Again, the letters form backwards. The letters are uh, uh, you know randomized uh, in a very very interesting fashion. Poor Papa with his Hagada book reading backwards with his finger to me. Passage next to Jerusalem. Dear oh dear, all the long business about that brought us out of the land of Egypt and to the house of bondage. Uh, Alleluia. Uh, Shema Israel. Uh, Adonai Elihu. Uh, no, that's the other. Then the two brothers, Jacob's son, and then the lamb, and the cat, and the dog, and the stick, and the water, and the butcher. And then the angel of death kills the butcher, and he kills the oaks, and the dog kills the cat. Sounds a bit silly till you come to look into it well. 
just as it means, but it, uh, it's every day eating everyone else, everybody eating everyone else. That's what life is after all. How quickly he does the job. Practice makes perfect. Seems to see with his fingers. So you can look at the way in which something so material and mechanical and almost, you know, flippant and vulgar is conjoined very interestingly with something spiritual. So the whole reference to Jerusalem is brought in over here. The whole reference to, you know, cannibalism is brought in over here. Uh, and then, of course, it cuts into the type setter at setting up the different types. And, uh, you know, this idea, this very nihilistic idea of life is something which is interesting over here. Uh, where he says that, you know, justice all means, but it's everybody eating everybody else. That's what life is after all. So it becomes a, a series of cannibalism, uh, you know, which is, which comes from the, you know, mythical tradition, which comes from the prehistoric times uh, of the movement of the Jews across the world, and the lamb and the cat and the dog and the stick and the water and the butcher, uh, everyone's consuming everyone else. And also that idea of consumption is now uh, translated into science. How is science consumed? in the advertisement industry and how a science consumed by people watching advertisements, right? So advertisements become a very big part of the flippant process through which uh, the machinery production of meaning takes place. Now, if you remember uh, the scene in uh, Mrs. Dalloway where the shell shock soldier Septimus Smith is walking around London and he suddenly sees this uh, advertisement on the, on the sky, uh, the advertisement uh, producing aeroplane which is advertising for toffee uh, and then how the letters form across the sky in little clouds. The letters are little clouds which are you know, produced as uh, vapors from the, uh, from the plane, the advertising aeroplanes and how the letters come together to make meaning, to make a sign which has a certain kind of meaning and that meaning making the, the production of meanings as it were uh, to an advertisement process is exactly what is mentioned over here uh, by Bloom and that is very much akin to cannibalism, that is very much akin to the you know consumption uh, of science and meaning. So cannibalism and consumption uh, are equated with each other. Uh, that's what you know, is indicated uh, or mentioned uh, when Bloom uh, you know, reflects on this fact. That's what life is after all, how quickly he does the job, practice makes perfect, seems to see with his fingers. Now Mr. Bloom passed on out of the clanking noises to the gallery onto the landing. Now am I going to tram it out of the way and then catch him up perhaps? Better phone him up first. Number? Yes, same as uh, Citroen's house, 28, 28, double phone. Only one smell than soap. Again, look at the way in which some random lines come in and you listen. It's almost like different kinds of voices, uh, echoes, uh, choric voices. And again, this is interesting because, you know, this is part of the Hellenic tradition of writing. So the advertisements over here, uh, they, they, uh, the advertising voices over here, they play a part like, you know, very similar to the Greek chorus. Uh, you know, the chorus which has come in and comment on the situation, but also stylize the situation. Because a part of the chorus, part of the choric character of, of the original Greek place is to comment and stylize the situation, making it into a condensed narrative and then dish it out for the audience as a commentary as well as a condensation. He went down the house staircase. Who the deuce scrawled all over these walls with matches? Looks as if they did it for a bet. Heavy, greasy smell that's always in his, those works. Luke and gloom in Tom's next door when I was here. He took out his handkerchief to dab his nose. Uh, citron lemon? Ah, the soap I put there. Lose it out of the pocket. Put him back his handkerchief and took out the sto soap and stored it away. Button in the hip pocket of his trousers. What perfume does the wife use? I could go home still. Tram, something I forgot. Just to see before dressing. No, here, no. A sudden screech of laughter came from the evening telegraph office. Know who that is? What's up? Pop in a minute to the phone. Ned Lambert it is. He entered softly. Erin, green gem of the silver sea. So again, the different kinds of voices come in as advertisement. Erin, the green gem of the silver sea. And before that, a certain kind of soap was being advertised. And also notice the way this one line of advertisements is cut into Bloom's consciousness. So how consciousness, which is obviously seen as an abstract metaphysical thing, is actually informed by the materiality of science, by the materiality of advertisements over here. This one-liners which are seen as flippant meanings. The flippancy of one-liners is what is actually informing consciousness over here and triggering different thought processes. So if you look at the way the thought processes operate in Ulysses, they're actually materially produced. It's not something which happens out of abstraction. He consumes the material meaning around him, the material markers around him, the material science around him. And in the process of consumption, he produces thought processes. He produces different kinds of abstract thought processes which link into each other in forming a stream of consciousness. So the stream of consciousness in Ulysses is not really an abstract phenomenon at all. It is something which is materially manufactured uh, due to the consumption of science around him, this endless consumption of science around him. 
Okay, now we come to the section where quite literally, you know, there's this relation about stream of consciousness and description of the stream of life becoming a consciousness and how life and consciousness are related to each other in forms of a streaming process and this should be on a screen. Uh, stream of life, what was the name of that priest looking chap was always squinting and when the when he passed, weak eyes, woman, stopped at Citroen Saint Kevin's parrot, pen something, uh, pen Dennis, my memory is getting pen. Of course, it was years ago, noise of the trams probably. Well, if you couldn't remember the day father's name that he sees every day. So again, memory becomes a large part of it and also look at the way in which uh, memory and machine are related to each other. So the loss of memory, the weakening of memory is attributed over here to the noise of the trams, right? Uh, Bartel Adasi was a tenor just coming out then, seeing her home out of practice, conceited fellow with his waxed up moustache, gave her the song, the winds of belief from the south. One the night that I was, uh, when, when, I fent, when I went to fetch her, that was lodge meeting on about those lottery tickets after Goodwin's concert in a super room or oak room of the mansion house, he and I behind. Sheet of her music blew out of my hand against the high school railings. Lucky it didn't. Things of that spoils the effect of a night for her. Professor Goodwin linking her in front, shaking on his pens. Poor old sort. His farewell concerts, positively lost appearance on any stage. Maybe for months or maybe for, for, for never. Remembering her laughing at the wind, her bizarre collar up. Corner of Halcourt Road remember that Gus Brufu blew up all the skirts and her bow nearly smothered old Goodwin. She didn't get flush in the wind. Remember when we got home raking up the fire and frying up the pieces of lap of mutton for a supper with the chutney sauce she liked and the mulled rum. Could see her in the bedroom from the hearth unclamping the busk of her stays white. So again, look at the way in which different kinds of color sensations, sound sensations, tactile sensations all come back in a flush in Bloom's mind as it remembers as an experience of Molly Bloom as they're coming back from a concert over here. So memory becomes a very large part in Ulysses. Memory and consciousness become a large part of identity in Ulysses. So how far can you remember becomes a large part of how well you can live. So your, your entire possession of life, your entire ownership in life in a way depends on memory, depends on your navigation with memory. And the navigation with memory can only take place in certain senses. So sensory perceptions are foregrounded, colors, sound, tactile sensations, smells, all this become large chunks of memory narratives across Ulysses. Okay. Uh, Swish and soft flop of hay of her stays made on the bed, always warm for her, always liked to let herself out. Sitting there after after till near two taking out her hairpins, Millie tucked in her beddy house, happy, happy, that was a night. Oh, Mr. Bloom, how do you do? Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Breen? No, he was complaining. How was Molly these those times? Haven't seen her for ages. In the pink, Mr. Bloom said gaily. Millie has a position down in Mullinger, you know her? Uh, go away, isn't a grand for her? In the photographer's there, getting on like a house on fire. How are all your charges? On the baker's list, Mrs. Breen said. How many has she? No other in sight. You're on the black, I see you have no. No, Mr. Bloom said, I've just come from a funeral. So again, look at the way in which her present conversation, the present just keeps invading back into the memory reverie that Mr. Bloom is experiencing. So he's having his reveries when he's transporting into the past and suddenly this little flippant conversation, uh, this you know, cutting in of the, of the present becomes a way uh, or occurs a way uh, uh, to this uh, seemingly innocuous questions, this random passes by that he sees, he encounters, the familiar faces he encounters, they ask him questions which bring him back to the present. So his reverie, so the temporality uh, in our politics is very interesting. So it's constantly moving back and forwards in time. And this is what I meant at the beginning of this lecture when I said that the entire temporal frame in Ulysses, the calendar frame is one day, the clock frame is one day. That's a very superficial structure. So within that superficial structure, we have deep embedded narratives of temporality running across each other, crisscrossing each other in a very hyperlinked kind of a way. Right, so the Joycean day is just one day in which different kinds of days, or different kinds of histories and memory narratives are operative. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, this reference to Dignam happens again. Uh, Mr. Bloom is asked why he's wearing black, why he's in mourning, and he says, Dignam, Mr. Bloom said, an old friend of mine, he died quite suddenly, poor fellow, heart trouble, I believe, funeral was this morning. So we've already seen that how, and again, even the funeral, which is again, the, the overarching rate of metempsychosis was taking place, everyone becomes soil and dust. And uh, Mr. Bloom, obviously, and uh, Lupa Bloom over there, uh, he mediated that image in his mind to the image of the gramophone, where he says that you know, every voice can be recorded inside a grave using a gramophone. So again, the machine, uh, the mundane and the metaphysical, they mix together in very interesting ways. Okay, so, um, and then of course, um, you know, the whole idea of sensoriness becomes important, and I'll stop at this point. Uh, hot, 
mock turtle vapor and stream of new bakes jump puffs rolly poly poured out of Harrison's. The heavy noon reek tickled on the top of Mr. Bloom's gullet. Want to make good pastry, butter, best flour, uh, demerara sugar, or they taste it with a hot tea. Or is it for her? Uh, from her, a barefoot Arab stood over the grating, breathing in the fumes, dead in the gnaw of hunger that way. Pleasure or pain is it? Penny dinner, knife and fork, chained to the table. So again, the whole point over here is interesting because you know this obviously references certain sensory uh, you know, feelings. The smell of tea, the smell of butter, the, the whole idea of uh, an eating becomes a sensory experience. But uh, you know this ambivalence about pain or pleasure becomes important over here because you know when these different kinds of senses mix over here, what happens is uh, it, this becomes an example of what we call synesthesia where different sense perceptions crisscross each other. So what you smell traditionally also becomes something which is which can be touched. Uh, so what can be touched also becomes something which you can hear. So different sense perceptions crisscross each other in a very heightened sentient situation and that becomes a very uh, a recursive phenomenon in Ulysses uh, to a large extent. Okay. Okay, so the last section that we'll deal with today is again it, it, it includes trams. So trams become, uh, you know, this is an important issue. Trams become very important machines, very important symbolic machines in Ulysses because trams cut back and across human thought processes in Ulysses. So every time Leopold Bloom has a thought process or has a sensation or experience, trams cut back and across it. So trams are not just innocuous machines over here. Trams, becomes, uh, trams become symbols of mobility, mobility of thoughts, movement of thoughts, and they also become interruptions in thought processes. So they become the very complex machinic presence in human streams of consciousness in this particular novel, and this should be on the screen. Trams pass one another, ingoing, outgoing, clanging. So the liminality of movement, the liminality of time coming in and going out simultaneously is in indicated by the movement of trams in, in, in Dublin and obviously trams become like veins and arteries uh, the nervous system as it were of the Dublin city. Useless words, things go on the same day after day, squats the police marching out, back, trams in, out. Those two loonies mooching about, dignum cutting off, cut it off, men are perfry, swollen belly on a bed, groaning to have a child, tucked out of her. One born every second somewhere, others dying every second since I fed the birds five minutes, 300 kicked the bucket, others 300 born, washing the blood off, all are washing the blood of the lamb, bowling mass. Again, the whole idea of liminality of life and death, the simultaneity of life and death has been indicated over here. But also look at the way in the very mundane material markers over here, which are used to describe certain very almost metaphysical, this is like a spiritual, you know, profound thought processes. There's simultaneity of life and death processes you know, happening together all the time. And trumps come in and come in and go, there's a movement of trumps coming in and leaving, uh, they become indicators of life and death and a life emerging in and life departing you. Right, so trumps become very important symbolic machines, symbolic instruments of thought processes over here. Uh, they almost become instruments of epiphany to a certain extent in Ulysses. And obviously uh, the reference to Dignam who is a dead man over here, uh, men are perfect about to have a child. So one child born every second somewhere uh, since I fed the birds five minutes. Uh, so the last five minutes since I fed the birds, Luper Bloom is thinking 300 children must have been born and 300 others uh, were dead. Uh, you know, and you know, so the same blood processes happen all the time, uh, you know, same blood processes uh, are carrying on all the time in terms of life and death. And then we have this example of city fool passing away, other city fool coming, passing away to others coming on, passing on. Houses, lines of houses, streets, miles of pavements, piled up bricks, stones, changing hands, this owner, that. Landlord never dies, they say. Others step into his shoes when he gets his notice to quit. They buy the place up with gold and still they have all the gold. Swindle it somewhere, pile up in cities, one away age after age, pyramids and sand, built on bread and onions, slave Chinese wall, Babylon, big stones left, round tires, rest rubble, sprawling suburbs, jerry built, Kernan's mushroom houses built a breeze, shelter for the night. No one is anything. So I'll stop at this point today. Now what this is obviously an, a very nihilistic thought, but the whole process of city fool passing away, another city fool coming. So the city becomes not just a physical landscape, the city also becomes a spiritual condition, a, a, a sentient condition. The city becomes uh, an architectural epiphany. So the entire idea of a city fool is looking at a certain kind of human population, a certain stream of human population coming in. So again, a city becomes an instrument of streaming. So the stream of consciousness technique is also materialized and manifested in the city movements. So city fool passing away, another city fool coming, passing away to others coming on, passing on. So the liminality of movement, the coming and going of movement is indicated to the city fullness. So city fool becomes a quantifiable quality of, uh, you know, uh, you know, consciousness away or the stream of consciousness as it were. And also look at the way in which 
the liminality of life, the simultaneous rise and fall in life is described with some very material markers and the material markers uh, they vary from the flippant landlord next door to the pyramids, the ancient pyramids. So the ancient pyramids are obviously almost prehistoric in quality. The architecture of civilization, great civilization, which is almost prehistoric in quality, is like so far back in time. And that is immediately conjoined together very complexly with the local landlords. So local landlords dying, someone else taking the place. So the money never goes away, people stepping in and dead people's places. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, the last line is interesting and that actually sums up the whole idea where no one is anything, right? So no one is anything means everything turns to nothingness at the end. And again, the nothingness produces something which then becomes nothing. So what is indicated over here is the cyclicity of life. Now Ulysses the novel is obviously about cyclicity and this is indicated also by the tram movements coming in and going in the stations. But that cyclicity gets a more postmodernist uh, extension, a most postmodernist presentation if you read for instance Finnegan's Wake. Uh, which uh, opens to a sentence which is a closing of the last sentence with which a novel ends. So the novel itself becomes structurally cyclical in quality and that is something which is indicated in Ulysses as well in great modernist detail. So the stream of consciousness is obviously part of the cyclicity and that is something which Ulysses keeps foregrounding and describing over and over again. So I stop at this point today and I will continue with this and hopefully start to wind up these novels in the lectures to come. Thank you for your attention.